Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Reefs Go Live. My name is Katie, and I'm going to be your host as you dive buddies join our team today for diving off the wall right here in Little Cayman. Now, for those of you students who have not joined us for a Reefs Go Live yet, let me tell you a little about how this is going to work. You students have an in-class activity sheet that we would love for you to interact with our dive team in order to complete. We've started you with an outline of our famous wall with a few organisms already on it for you. If you see those organisms throughout the dive, let me know. I will ask our underwater educator, Maisie, if she can find one for us, tell us what depth it's at, and what the name of that organism is. Now, if you see any other organisms as we travel up and down the depth of that wall, let us know. We'll try to make sure we get them named for you and you can label them and draw them on your in-class activity sheet. Now, we're going to learn about a couple of large objectives today, mainly about how these Cayman Islands were formed using plate tectonics and some coastal geology. Also learning about how microhabitats have formed as we get closer to that wall based on a few oceanographic properties and how those microhabitats change the differing organisms that live there. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. We've got our underwater educator Maisie down there. Maisie, can you get us started with what exactly is the wall? Of course I can. Hello everyone. As Katie said, my name is Maisie and I am going to be your underwater educator for today's dive. Now before I start talking about the wall itself, I would like to introduce the environment that I am on right now. This area right here where we are seeing so much diversity is the reef terrace. And this is right at the top of the wall. We can see here there is so much life. We're seeing lots of soft corals, we're seeing lots of hard corals, sponges, fish, so much biodiversity. Now, the wall itself actually drops down from this reef terrace all the way down to tens, hundreds, or maybe even thousands of meters. And it literally drops down and can be as straight as the walls in your house, dropping all the way down to really, really deep depths. Now, as we travel down this wall, conditions change, and this can affect the type of organisms that we're seeing there. And that is the main purpose of our class that we're going to be having today. Awesome. Great introduction today's dive, Maisie. This is sure to be an epic dive for Absolutely, considering that wall right behind you. Now, I bet a lot of our dive buddies are wondering, you're over that reef terrace before you get to that wall, but because that wall is so significant to Cayman, how was it formed exactly? Well, this wall structure actually formed when the Cayman Islands themselves rose out of the sea about 30 to 40 million years ago. Wow. Now, this happened because at the very, very depths of the ocean, there are two tectonic plates, the North American plate and the Caribbean plate. And they were converging and pushing into one another. Now, this caused a lot of hot volcanic rock to form an underwater mountain chain called the Cayman Ridge. And on top of this Cayman Ridge, is the Cayman Islands themselves. So what do you think about, you guys watching, when you think about a mountain? Well, I like to think of some really, really steep walls. And this is what this wall structure is. It literally drops off into basically nothing. And it is so, so steep. So Maisie, what you're saying is that basically you are underwater on a mountain range that we are seeing on top as the Cayman Islands. And for you dive buddies, I'm sure many of you, if you're joining us from Cayman, know that the highest point above water in Cayman is on Cayman Brack, and that's the bluff, at about 141 feet, or 43 meters. Now, Maisie is diving, as she said, over a really deep part of our Caribbean Ocean, known as the Cayman Trench. Maisie, how deep is that trench where you are? Well, this trench is super, super deep. So earlier when I spoke about those two tectonic plates meeting, the North American plate and the Caribbean plate, 
That makes it this place called the Kramer Trench. And the deepest part of this trench is down at 7,500 meters. So super, super deep. And these two plates are no longer converging and pushing into one another. Instead, they're now sliding past one another in something called a transform vault. And they are sliding past one another at a rate of about 19 millimeters a year. That's really interesting and something I did not know until we were working on creating this broadcast. So really cool to think about. We're actually moving 19 millimeters per year. And again, just to put the depth of this trench into perspective for you dive buddies, the deepest point in the ocean in the entire world is called the Marianas Trench. And that's out in the Pacific Ocean. And that's over 11,800 meters deep, more than twice as deep as the bottom of the Cayman Trench here, which Maisie and our team are diving over. So that's pretty deep. Now, Maisie, by now you must be kind of over the edge of that reef terrace. Do you think that you can point out to us an organism right there on the edge that maybe our dive buddies can get a closer look at? Yep, of course I can. So, yep, we are just right on the very edge of this reef terrace right here. And what I would like us to point out is actually there are so many juvenile rats that are just swimming around us and going absolutely crazy. Cool. And there is so much fish life just on top of this reef, and it is so awesome. Interesting. I wonder if they're schooling all over there. Perhaps they're spawning. Yeah, I definitely think that that's spawning. They keep um, swimming really, really close together and then darting away really, really quickly. So it's some really interesting behavior down here. Interesting. So Maisie, you're seeing some juvenile yellowhead wrasse, I believe you said. And how deep are you seeing that school of wrasse? So right now we are at 11.4 meters. So you guys watching at school or at home, please write that down on your in-class activity sheet. Excellent. That sounds great. Our first organism to write down those in-class activity sheets. Now, we're also diving in a really incredible part of Little Cayman, the Bloody Bay Marine Park, which is one of the most renowned marine protected areas in the Caribbean. Maisie, can you tell us a little bit about this dive site before you go over the edge of that wall? Of course I can. We are at a dive site called Randy's Gazebo, which, as Katie said, is inside the Bloody Bay Marine Park here on Little Cayman. And because this marine park has been in place for such a long time, we have had lots of protection here, and that's why there is such a wide biodiversity. And we're seeing all these hundreds and thousands of fish that are swimming around us. Awesome. That sounds great. Now, one really cool fact to know is that actually the Cayman Islands government has recently expanded the marine parks here in Little Cayman, on Cayman Brac, and over in Grand Cayman with the assistance of the Department of Environment and the National Trust of the Cayman Islands. So this marine park is about to get even bigger and more special. So sure to become a really sought after dive site. Now, Maisie, I think it's time that we're going to send you over the wall and and while we do that, I want our dive buddies to think about and watch how the light is changing as you're moving slowly down the wall. And in fact, that is the first physical property that we wanted to discuss today and the creation of these micro habitats, correct? Yes, that is correct, Katie. So cool. when we're talking about these physical properties, light is one of the most important ones. So most of the light that we have here on this wonderful planet that we call home is from the sun. Now, most of the light that's inside of the ocean is from the sun as well. And as we descend down through the ocean, the sunlight that comes down actually gets absorbed by the ocean itself. And so as you descend down, it gets darker and darker and darker. And this is because, as I said, the water is absorbing it. So this gives us two key zones in the ocean. It gives us the photic zone at the top of the ocean, where there is sunlight. And then below this, in the very depths of the ocean, you have this zone called the aphotic zone, where there is no light inside of there at all. 
and you can kind of see that we are obviously diving inside the photic zone. We are not going all the way down to the depths of the ocean. But even as I'm slowly descending down, you can see that I'm getting a little bit darker and a little bit bluer as I'm descending. We can already see that, Maisie. We can tell that in the beginning of the dive, you were very bright and we saw a lot of vibrant colors. And even now, while you're just next to that reef terrace, we're losing a little bit of that color. And that's exactly what you were talking about with light attenuation. Now, for you dive buddies at home, Maisie was talking about the photic zone versus the aphotic zone. Photic, the root word meaning light. So that light is very important for organisms that require it for, again, photosynthesis, as Maisie said. Now, Maisie, do you have any organisms right next to you which maybe you could talk about using this process of photosynthesis and why they need to be in that photic zone? Yeah, of course I do. So I have this massive hermetific coral right here so if our cameraman Sam can get a nice zoom up of that so let's just recap what a hermetific coral is great so a hermetific or a stony coral is a singular animal called a coral polyp now inside each one of these little kind of lumps that you're seeing on top of the coral this houses a singular coral polyp, which I like to describe as an upside down jellyfish. Now this little upside down jellyfish like creature has actually secreted a little calcium carbonate home for itself called a coral like cup, which is what all these bumps are that we're seeing on top of the coral. Yeah, Maisie, we're getting a great shot from our cameraman Sam of those coral like cups and the polyps there on a beautiful great star coral that's really red looking so we know exactly what you're talking about yeah it looks so awesome and these little jellyfish like creatures the coral polyps they actually have a photosynthetic symbiotic algae that lives inside of their tissues called zooxanthellae and because it is photosynthetic it requires sunlight like most plants in order to be able to produces energy and food most of which it gives to the coral itself so the coral itself this big colony needs the sunlight in order to be able to survive totally makes sense Maisie now for any of our dive buddies who maybe aren't snorkelers or divers just yet of course we highly encourage you to go out and explore this incredible coral reef around our Cayman Islands right in your front yard but if you don't have the ability to go out and snorkel, these our dive buddies can actually go for a walk along the Iron Shore and see evidence of these hermatypic or reef building corals right on that Iron Shore. Is that right, Maisie? Yeah, that is totally true. So when I was speaking about the Cayman Island formation earlier, I did say that we were mostly built as out of volcanic rock. Now this is mostly true, but actually when this Cayman Ridge formed, this underwater mountain ridge formed, it kind of ended just below the surface of the ocean. So what happened is that it was in a very, very similar environment to the top of the reef terrace right here now. Now, as we can see, this environment is very, very good for growing corals. So these massive coral reefs form, and then over time, the sea level has actually fallen. That's due to things like the polar ice caps forming in the northern and the southern hemisphere. And because of this, the sea level has fallen, these coral reefs have actually been exposed. Now, unfortunately, this has caused them to die, but it has been that the Cayman Islands themselves actually form. And we can see evidence of this as we travel around the Cayman Islands, especially when we go to places like the Iron Shore Formation, where we can see these old fossilized coral reefs. 
That's awesome. It's really cool to think that our dive buddies can actually take a step back in time and interact and see evidence of that sea level rise and fall, as you mentioned, Maisie. Now, before we move on to our next oceanographic property, After Light, I think you have a really excellent demonstration to show our dive buddies how artificial light can actually bring color back into the spectrum. Is that correct? Yep, I totally do. So Excellent. You guys may have noticed, as I said earlier, that I'm becoming a little bit bluer and darker as we travel down. And this is because this light is being absorbed by the ocean. Now, what I have right here is I have a colour chart and I also have a torch, which is an artificial source of light. So I'm going to come a little bit closer to Sam's camera right now. And you're going to be able to see that on this colour wheel, we're not really seeing bright reds and purples like we would normally see. That's because it's typically these wavelengths of light, especially the red wavelengths of light, that are being absorbed first as we travel down into the ocean. Now, if I turn on this torch, we can actually see that these reds and these purples become really, really clear. And we can see that they're actually a lot brighter than they appear on your screen when I turn it off. And the red kind of goes a little bit more brown in colour. Maisie, sorry, I didn't hear what you just said, but I think it has to do with the fact that you were showing us the introduction of the colour on that colour wheel as you get closer to the camera and farther away, is that right? Yep, that's right. I just switched on the light, pointed it at the colour wheel, and then it was a lot brighter because the artificial light was on top of it. Perfect. Okay, that's a great visual representation. Thanks for getting that really close to the camera so our dive buddies at home can really see and engage and understand what you're talking about. Now, I'm not going to advise the students to keep an eye on that color wheel as you get deeper, but as you slowly move down the wall, I'm sure they're going to notice that, as you said earlier, you're going to get a little more blue. Now again, this is because of that light attenuation, but also probably has a little bit to do with the next physical property that we wanted to talk about, which is temperature. How cold are you feeling down there, Maisie? <laughs> I'm feeling relatively cold. <laughs> so, but yes, this is a great second physical property for us to talk about. So, the sun, which is causing the light in the ocean, is also basically heating up the ocean itself as well. Because, obviously, light heats water. So, as we descend down through the ocean, it's not just the sunlight which is decreasing, it is the temperature as well. But sometimes, the ocean doesn't like to follow the same rules that we have for light. So sometimes in the top half of the ocean, all the water mixes and it all becomes uniform. Let's say in the top 10 meters of the ocean. Now, as we descend through this area, it all stays the same temperature, it's all really nice but the water below it is actually super cold. So if you guys at home are divers or free divers, you may notice that sometimes as you descend down, you get really, really cold really, really quickly. And that's because we have this rapid decrease or change in temperature in certain areas, and this is called, called a thermocline. Yeah, and I, we can't really see your thermocline down there, Maisie, but as you said, I'm sure you can feel it. And, you know, we have our first question from one of our students over in Grand Cayman. Josh at the Lighthouse School wants to know, what do corals eat exactly? Well, that is a great question, Josh. And what they eat is actually, it is mainly they're getting all of their energy from that photosynthetic algae that is inside their tissue called zooxanthellae. But at night time, they extend their polyps and they are just moving through the water column and they're trying to find inorganic nutrients that they can eat. Great answer, Maisie. And something that we've reviewed in some of our previous Reef School Lives as well. So Josh and the rest of the Lighthouse School, we'd love for you guys to see some of the other Reef School Live that we've talked about in the past, maybe a review of coral reefs where we really get 
deep in what is a coral, what they eat, how old they can get, all kinds of fun facts like that. So great question. And guys, keep them coming. We're here to answer your questions. So make sure you're giving us plenty to work with, okay? Now, Maisie, you were talking about that thermocline earlier. There are certain organisms which really can only survive in a limited threshold of temperature as well, including those corals that Josh was asking about. And they can only survive between about 23 and 29 degrees centigrade. What happens if temperature is outside of that range? So if temperature is outside of that range, it can actually cause this thing called coral bleaching. When the coral gets rid of its photosynthetic zooxanthellae, which give it its colour, but as we also mentioned earlier, they give the coral most of its food. So, and this happens with soft corals, even like this one that I have right here in front of me, which is at 14.8 metres. Great, thanks for noting that. 14.8 meters, this yeah. uh, bent sea rod, I believe that is, or a soft coral. Yeah, that's totally true. And we also have a Nassau grouper that is just swimming us down past us here, which is super cool. Oh, sweet. So keep an eye out for that dive, buddies. A Nassau grouper coming down there. I guess we can see it. So great work by you guys and our cameraman, Sam. Yeah, definitely. I think that Nassau is probably down at 16 metres, so we're not going to go and swim down there. But kind of going back to coral bleaching, essentially it's causing the coral to lose its symbiotic algae. And then because it doesn't have its main source of food that comes from the algae, it can actually cause it to die. Okay, now Maisie, we do have a question coming in from Cayman Brack. One of the students wants to know, they didn't really see the Nassau grouper. It was below you and it was pretty camouflaged. Why might that be? So the reason that it looks so camouflaged is because it's actually trying to blend in with the surroundings. So if you look at a Nassau grouper, it is dark on the surface and it is white on the underside. Now, if you are a prey that the Nassau grouper is trying to hunt, if you are looking at it from above, like I was or we were just now, then you're not going to be able to see it very well. However, if the Nassau is swimming above you and it is showing its white underside, then you're also not going to be able to see it very well either. And this is a thing called counter shading. And this is so that the Nassau grouper can kind of hide from the prey that it is trying to hunt. So it is a super cool adaptation. That is awesome. I'm so glad we got to see an apex predator with counter shading. That's something that you dive buddies of ours should keep an eye out for. And it's something that we see exhibited in many apex predators. So you may see that counter shading in sharks, other groupers, some snappers, even some stingrays as well. So keep an eye out for things like that. That's a great question. Now, Maisie, we've talked a little bit about the light attenuation as a physical property, kind of building these micro habitats as well as temperature so as I'm sure all of our dive buddies can tell it's pretty wavy up here which is another physical property which really forms these microhabitats. can you please tell our dive buddies a little bit about that yeah of course I can so wave action only really affects the very very top of the reef terrace the top of the wall that's because most waves are formed out at sea and they're actually formed by the wind blowing across the very surface of the ocean and causing that water to move. Okay, Maisie, actually, Ruth Anna wants to know, what is your depth right now? Maybe she wants to draw you on her in-class activity sheet as well. <laughs> I'm at 13.4 meters. Thank you for asking. 13.4 meters. Excellent. <laughs> now, while we're at it, Maisie, let me just ask you, how are you doing on your air down there? Yeah, of course. I am on 120 bar. Thank you for asking. Great. Now, we do about 15, 20 minutes left of our dive, so plenty of time to highlight some more of these awesome organisms down there. Um, I believe you were talking a little bit about uh, that wave action, so why don't you go ahead and continue what you were saying there as far as a physical property. 
Yeah, of course I can. So I was just talking about how waves are formed out of sea by the wind blowing across the surface of the ocean. Now, when these waves are in this very, very deep ocean, they're not really bashing into, they're not really moving anything around. However, as they come into this more shallower environment, for example, where this reef terrace is right here, they are going to start hitting into things. They are going to start moving things around. Like these corals and these sea fans that I have right in front of me. So at the top of the wall, you tend to find a lot of wave action. And as you travel closer to shore, that gets greater and greater. But the key thing that I'm trying to point out here is that at the top of the wall, you have greater light, a higher temperature, mm -hmm. and more wave action. Now, some of the creatures have adapted for this. So we go over here and we look at some of these beautiful common sea fans that are at 12.5 meters. Now, these sea fans have adapted to live in this high wave energy environment. And this is because, like all soft corals and all the hard corals, they don't really have any legs, so they can't really <laughs> wander around and find their own food. Now, what a sea fan has done and adapted to do is that it has rooted itself so that the prevailing current caused by these waves actually pushes through them and it pushes through its fan structure right here. Now inside this fan structure, this is where its polyps are extended so that they're literally catching all the inorganic nutrients and particles that pass through it. So this is a great example of a creature that has adapted to live in the very specific environment that it is in. Excellent. Thank you so much for showing us that, um, that soft coral with that wave action, Maisie. It's really easy for us to see how they're able to let that water pass over them from that wave energy. And I think here is a perfect place to kind of insert that this is another reason why our coral reefs are so important for humans and the natural environment. Those waves in a large storm are really dissipated by that Cayman Trench and our wall and the coral reefs surrounding all of the Cayman Islands. So right there, a perfect reason why we need to protect them for the future. Yes, I totally agree. And this is, you know, such a biodiverse area that we just want to protect it just for the huge amount of species that live here as well. Now, Maisie, we've actually got some questions from York, England for you. So some of your native people. <laughs> B&D want to know, how many years can corals live for? That is an awesome question. And corals can live for such a long time. You know, I spoke about earlier those little individual coral polyps that we find inside a coral. Well, they actually are just one individual and they essentially clone themselves in order to make that massive coral colony. Now, because of this, the corals can live for a super, super long time. So they can live for thousands and thousands of years. And we think that all modern day corals are pretty much within this thousands of years sort of age range. Interesting. All right, now, Maisie, that is a huge fun fact about the age of our corals and how long they can live on our reefs. What depth are you at now? I am at 13.2 meters. 13.2 meters, excellent. And we're about 25, 30 minutes into our broadcast. So uh, how is your air doing? I'm all good, thank you. I'm at 100 bar. Excellent. Now, we've done a lot of um, discussion about some benthic organisms or organisms that live on the coral reef wall or on the floor. Now, someone has pointed out a Christmas tree worm. So maybe you could give a short introduction to one of these invertebrates and what depth you're at and what role they play on the reef. Yes, of course I can. So Great. our cameraman Sam is just going to zoom in and get an awesome close-up of that little yellow Christmas tree worm that we have right here. Cool. Now, Christmas tree worms are really awesome creatures. They actually bore themselves into the coral 
And you see those two little spirals or the two Christmas trees that are coming out in that picture? Those are actually the two gills of one single worm. Whoa, so they have their gills on the outside of their home or their body, very dissimilar to fish that have their gills internally? Yeah, they are completely different. And if you go close to a Christmas tree worm, or for example, there is a wave that bashes into them, they can actually pull both of those gills in into that nice protective main body area inside that calcareous tube that they have made inside of the coral. Wow, really interesting. And just so our dive buddies know, this is a great intro, intro to our Reef Skull Live that Maisie is going to be your underwater educator for, again, later on in the season, highlighting our incredible invertebrates. So Maisie, can you give us a sneak peek? What can we expect out of the incredible invertebrates lesson? Oh, we are going to discuss what an invertebrate is. We're going to discuss a couple of the key invertebrate species that we find here on the Cayman Islands. And talk about their awesome adaptations to the different places where they live on the reef. But this Christmas tree worm that we have right here, for you guys watching our school with your in-class activity sheets, it is at 12.9 meters. 12.9 meters, excellent. Uh, thanks for showing us that Christmas tree worm, Sam. That was great footage. And we've got our next question coming in from a friend of ours, actually, in Grand Cayman. Maisie, Nick Ebanks wants to know, is the wall a great place to see sharks and other big fishes or apex predators? It is. Thanks for that awesome question, Nick. This is a great place to see those really big pelagic fish. And by pelagic, I mean that fish that swim out in the open ocean. Because let's face it, if we look at the coral reef here that I have on my left, this is a very, very different environment to the big blue that is over here on my right. And the fish that live in these two separate areas have very, very different livelihoods. The fish that live on the coral reef tend to be a little bit smaller compared to the fish that we find out in the big blue over here that essentially grow really, really big, really, really quickly and don't have as long-lived lives as the fish on the coral reef. So yeah. in this environment here, you are going to see the smaller coral reef fish and also the larger pelagic fish as well that are swimming by. So fingers crossed we get visited by some of those bigger species during this broadcast. Absolutely. I think we'd all love to see some really big stuff coming in to check out our broadcast. Maisie, we're getting some excellent footage of the comparison between that beautiful coral reef on your left-hand shoulder and that deep blue abyss on your right-hand shoulder. The comparison between those two environments right next to each other is incredible, and it looks amazing. So many of our dive buddies really want to join you right now, but it's a little bit scary. How can they join you in the future for a snorkel or a dive? Well, guys, if you want to go snorkeling, then there's so many different spots that you can go to around the Cayman Islands. And I know that some of you guys that are watching may already be scuba certified, but if you're not, then you can always try that out in many of the scuba shops that we have here as well. But if you guys at home want to come snorkeling or diving with me, then you can get, definitely come and join us on some of CCMI's awesome education programs, either our marine ecology courses or our sea camps that we hold in the summer, because I would love to explore this beautiful environment with you. That sounds great, Maisie. I hope all of our dive buddies are able to take the opportunity to do that. Now, our cameraman Sam is seeing some beautiful fairy basslets on that wall right now, and that really ties in nicely with a question that we just got from another friend, uh, Federico from Italy, wondering um, how do all these colors exist on this coral reef? What is giving us those colors exactly? Well, what is giving us all of those colors? Is are we talking about the corals or are we talking about the fish themselves? I think he wants to know a broad answer to both. He's just really impressed with all of the vibrant colors that we're starting to see as you guys slowly start ascending back up that wall. Well, the reason that we have so many exciting bright colors on the coral reef 
It's mainly because there is so much diversity. And so different species have to look really bright and colourful in order to stand out with one another. And this is very typical of very biodiverse ecosystems. Think about if you have a tropical rainforest jungle. There's lots of birds there, for example, that have really, really bright feathers so that they can stand out to their species. And it's very similar with all the fish that we have here as well. Just like these awesome fairy basslets that are just down here next to me. Yeah, they're really beautiful and popping off of that reef, which is great to see. It also shows a little bit more about that biodiversity that you were talking about earlier and how everything just seems to be so much healthier down there than some other reefs that we've seen locally and around the world. Lots of fishes, lots of corals. What depth were those fairy basslets that we saw at? Can you tell our dive buddies? So these fairy basslets are at 12 meters. 12 meters, excellent. And we have about five to six more minutes on our dive today, Maisie. So uh, I can see that now you're back up on that reef terrace or that reef edge. Any other organisms of note that maybe our dive buddies could mark down on their in-class activity sheets? Yes, of course. What we're going to do now is we are going to look at several sponges I'm actually seeing on the reef. So we're just going to come over here and we are going to look at this awesome yellow tube sponge that's just right in front of me. Oh, cool. Yeah, it is super cool. So yellow tube sponges are really important for the reef because earlier we mentioned some sponges as well and the role they're playing on this reef as sort of the cleaners of the ocean or the vacuum cleaners of the sea. Again, eating a lot of that detritus and a lot of those really small particles and molecules and even nutrients that is dirtying up the oceans and they're cleaning it out for us. So seeing those yellow tube sponges is really excellent for for the health of the reef. And what depth is that sponge at, Maisie? So this yellow tube sponge is at 10.8 meters. 10.8 meters. On top of this tube sponge, we can see a couple of brittle starfish that are just inside the main hole that we have right here. Oh, some, some brittle stars, you said? Yes. Oh, cool. Okay, probably another organism that we can highlight in our incredible invertebrates lesson a little bit later on. So, Maisie, I'm going to ask you to start slowly making your way up off of that reef terrace and making your way sort of back to the boat. We just want to make sure that we've got a little more time for some questions um, and that we can uh, get a few more last minute things in before we have to say goodbye. So Spot Bay Primary School is wondering, we've mentioned a couple different sponges. How many different species of sponges are there? <laughs> well, actually, here in the Cayman Islands and in many places of the world, we know barely anything about sponges. We have got no idea how many species there are. I think we actually had a sponge biologist visiting CCMI a couple of years ago. We did. And when he went diving, he was seeing new sponges that no one had ever described before. Awesome. So this really does just go to show that these coral reef environments are so complex and we still don't know so much about them. Great. That's a perfect answer, Maisie, because there is still so much more research to be done. And that's something that I love talking to our dive buddies about because a lot of people think that, oh, it takes so long to become a scientist. But really, we're all just big kids. And we have all these questions to things that we want to know the answers to. And that right there is the perfect opportunity for all of you dive buddies to become a scientist, come out and research with us and learn what really is making up these coral reefs. Now, Maisie, I want to ask you one last question before we start saying our goodbyes, and that is on our overall impact on these reefs, because we had another question from Ty Miller asking, is plastic affecting sponges, microplastics or single-use plastics in the oceans, either in that shallow reef environment or at depth? You know, plastics are unfortunately affecting every single part of the marine and the terrestrial environment. Mm. So I remember, Katie, earlier you spoke about 
the one of the trenches that we were just talking about. So the Cayman Trench is super, super deep, right? That is over 7,500 meters deep. And even down at the bottom of the Cayman Trench, you can still find plastics oh, all wow. the way down in that deep darkness. So plastics are not just affecting the sponges and the fish and everything else on this reef, but even the very, very depths of the ocean. That is a real shame. And I want to take this opportunity to reiterate to our dive buddies, all of you joining us today, this is something that every single one of you, as well as ourselves, can actually make a, can actually make an impact in this local environment. As Maisie said, terrestrially and marine. If we remember our five R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, rethink, and refuse single-use plastics and things that we just don't need, we minimize the, uh, the likelihood of them ever making their way onto that reef where they could unfortunately harm a sponge or an animal at depth. So Maisie, I think it's time for us unfortunately to leave the wall, so do you have any last words of inspiration you want to leave with our dive buddies today before we say goodbye? Well, you dive buddies, I would just like to say a massive, massive thank you for joining us today on today's dive. And the take-home message that I would like you guys to have is that coral reefs are wonderfully complex environments. You know that all of these environmental conditions change and this really does affect the organisms that are living here. And every single one of those organisms that live in this wonderful marine environment deserve to be protected and we should be trying to reduce the threats that us humans put on these environments. But that is it from me. Once again, a huge thank you and goodbye for now until we see each other on our next Reef Sky Live broadcast. Great. Thanks so much, Maisie. You and the team, go ahead and slowly make your way back up to us here on the boat and we'll see you topside in just a bit. Sounds great. See you in a bit. Bye, everyone. All right. Now, for you dive buddies who are still joining us for the last few minutes, thank you so much, as Maisie said, for being here today. All of you students and friends and family here in the Cayman Islands and abroad, as it seems that we had quite the audience today joining us, um, if you have any extra questions, please do submit those to us now. We'll make sure that we work with Maisie as soon as she comes up from her dive to get you the answers that you need. Now, we also had that in-class activity sheet where you students were working on identifying organisms, their name, and their depth. If you had any more to ask us, now is the time. We talked about a lot of broad concepts today, the geology of the Cayman Islands, how they were formed with plate tectonics, and how that creates these microhabitats with light attenuation, temperature, and wave action. Those were a lot of big oceanographic terms, so again, any questions, just let us know. Otherwise, we hope that each of you will join us live again for our next Reef School Live on May 15th. For now, it's a goodbye from our Reefs Go Live team here on Little Cayman, and we'll see you soon.